Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. Prime Minister Narendra Modi last week asserted that flexible workplaces are the future and that it will also create opportunities for women's labor force participation. So today we ask if the hybrid work culture is the solution to the country's historically low women labor force participation. One of the five pledges that Prime Minister Narendra Modi appealed Indians to adopt during his Independence Day speech was equality, specifically equality for women. He called for full participation of the nation's women power so that India can achieve its goals faster. The PM followed this up with another proclamation last week at the National Conference of Labor Ministers of all states and union territories. He strongly backed the work from home ecosystem and flexible work hours calling them the future. This, he said, will encourage a higher number of women to work. Modi's remarks assume significance as India has one of the world's lowest female labor force participation rate. The rate is a measure of the proportion of a country's working age population that engages actively in the labor market, either by working or looking for work. The gender ratio in workforce has gotten more skewed towards men, despite more women getting educated. Women's net enrollment in schools and colleges has increased and reached near parity with men. India's female labor force participation rate has dropped steadily in the last decade and a half, from 32% in 2005 to just 19.2% in 2021, although the latest data reflects a slight recovery from 18.6%, the lowest in 32 years, in the first year of the pandemic in 2020. The Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, a private think tank, says male LPR was 66% in January to April 2022, while the female LPR was only 9%. In this metric, India fares worse than countries like China, Brazil, UAE, Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia. According to a recent analysis from Bloomberg Economics, closing the employment gap between men and women could add more than 30% or $6 trillion to India's GDP by 2050. Having said that, the International Labour Organization, or ILO, found that a significant proportion of women usually reported their willingness to accept work if assignments were made available at their household premises. The ILO report indicates 34% of rural Indian women and 28% in urban areas were willing to accept work at home. So, is the trend of work from home, which caught on during the pandemic, the solution to reverse India's falling female labour force participation? It is partly, definitely yes, because women who are in their ages or uh, where they are, they, uh, where they have, where, where they have young children, or it is a childbearing age, would really want to work, but they do not want to really be uh, traveling to workplaces or be at the workplaces physically present for a very long uh, for very long hours. If they get the time to work on their own terms, at in terms of using the time that they have at house, it's always attractive, and we see more women joining that kind of workforce. But that is only for an age group which is between 25 to 35. But after 35 plus onwards, women do look forward to move out and work at work, phys- work from physically from the office spaces. The moment it is work from home and the flexible options are given, the remunerations are downgraded, whereas it should be the opposite. The op- why? Because the infrastructure from where, which is being used by the woman is actually the woman's own. Somebody should pay for it, right? Ideally, the employer. The flip side is, women working from home are also carrying on their household work or taking care of their children. Therefore, the length of the workday and burden of work, including both paid and unpaid, increases substantially for women. Here, corporates can help by adopting policies that allow women to work different hours. Work from home is an allowance that can be made for certain types of work and should be made if it is needed. Absolutely. 
the problem is are there jobs that allow women to work from home and log in and you know do sort of the work that they would do in office so i don't know whether work from home possibilities will create new jobs but i think it's really welcome that the prime minister of india has acknowledged the problem of low female labor force participation rates you know the real problem is that the decline of uh, the female labor force participation rate is in rural india i think the government must talk also about sharing the burden of domestic yeah. chores but these are social changes these yeah. take time what is actionable is things like creation of jobs or transportation or toilets or you know uh, uh, sensitizing employers but i think we are talking about a broader problem here where it may not be conservatism but may just not be availability of jobs or not availability of transport there is a job in the district center which is very far away you are living in a village while pm modi's remarks are a welcome first step towards tackling the issue of declining workforce participation rate of women it is time for india inc to step up and accommodate the demands of the female workforce the ball is now in the employer's court While addressing the labor conference prime minister modi emphasized on the need for change according to the changing scenario and just like the labor laws the country's education system is too is up for an overhaul a recent initiative by the university grants commission is a testimony to that it has given a nod to draft guidelines for engaging industry experts as professors of practice soon professionals with over 15 years of experience will be seen taking classes in universities and colleges imparting their domain expertise to students what are the pros and cons of this move find out in our next report over 4 years after launching a lateral entry scheme to induct private sector professionals in government departments and almost a year after hiring 31 such experts for different departments and ministries the government is now going to implement something similar in the field of education the university grants commission recently approved draft guidelines under which professionals like civil servants engineers military personnel lawyers artists and media persons with 15 years of experience might soon be able to teach at universities and colleges without a phd or clearing the net these professors of practice will also design their own curriculum and collaborate with industry for project work and securing internships The guidelines also said that these industry experts would be exempt from the condition of publishing a research paper which is otherwise crucial for faculty recruitment at such institutions. The hiring of a professor of practice will not fill any of the sanctioned posts of the institutions. Thus, the scheme will not affect the number of sanctioned posts or the recruitment of regular faculty members. The UGC has approved the scheme and is now seeking feedback on the draft guidelines. While distinguished experts from various fields will be welcome as candidates, the professor of practice position will not be open to those in the teaching profession, either serving or retired. Under the guidelines, these professors of practice will be engaged for a fixed term. Their maximum tenure will be 3 years with a conditional 1 year extension. Also, the number of such professors will not exceed 10% of the institution's sanctioned posts. One of the key objectives of the guidelines which are likely to be notified in September is to ensure that what is being taught at these institutions meets the needs of the industry. Another is to give higher education institutions the opportunity to work on joint research and consultancy projects with these industry experts. The guidelines indicate a shift towards training and skilling relevant to industry. The engineering and information technology industries in particular might benefit from such a move in the long term. According to a 2019 NASCOM survey, India produces 15 lakh engineering graduates every year. However, only 2.5 lakh of them succeed in getting jobs in the core engineering industry. 
Another survey by Aspiring Minds found that 80% of Indian engineers were unemployed in 2019. The lack of industry-ready skills and work readiness among newly minted engineers is the problem. In the past, a mismatch has also emerged between the skills that the industry needs, such as AI, machine learning and data engineering, and what is being taught, leading to a supply-demand gap in talent. Uh, because it's the industrial experts who are going to get into the teaching and they would be the one who will be handling the students, will help them prepare mentally, align themselves and their expectation so that their learning curve shortens and they settle down at the workplace faster, which would be much appreciated by any employer today. Yeah. But the two things that needs to be really be mindful of that sharing of uh, you know, your hands-on experience is not that the student is gaining a hands-on experience. So it should not, the program should not be compromised. There should still be emphasis on the work-based learning programs or work-based curriculums. One more thing that one has to be really careful is that it's not necessary that an industry expert is going to be a good teacher. So there has to be a lot of emphasis on ensuring that uh, the industry experts gain those skills or acquire those teaching skills, the training skills, so they do justice to their role. A number of American and British universities and colleges also employ professors of practice. Take, for example, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. To bring real-world lessons and professional experience to its students, MIT started appointing professors of the practice and associate professors of the practice starting in 1997. Other top institutions such as Harvard, Yale, Princeton and Columbia have rosters of leading practitioners, many of whom teach on a part-time basis. IITs and IIMs also employ professors of practice. For example, the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, says that in order to be considered for the associate or full professor of practice roles, the candidate must have more than 10 years of experience in industry or government in senior positions. While the candidates must preferably hold a PhD, it is not an essential criterion. However, a lack of PhD must be offset by domain knowledge obtained in the field. In fact, the qualifications set out for professors of practice in the UGC guidelines are very similar to those required by some IITs for the same role. However, a section of educators in India has reservations about the policy. The Delhi Teachers Association has opposed the Professor of Practice scheme, saying that it will dilute the quality of higher education. This is not a very new idea. There is always a provision that you can appoint people uh, who are eminent in their own areas of expertise as professors and they, they don't need to have PhD. What is new is that they are, uh, the UGC says that you can appoint 10% of the strength uh, over and above. So the question is, is UGC or the government also giving money for these posts? If not, then this, uh, this announcement means nothing. Uh, so outwardly, it sounds very good, laudable, uh, but substantially, it's nothing. Because if you're not giving money, you are telling universities to raise money for this, uh, then it's meaningless. Under the UGC guidelines, the professor of practice posts can be funded by the industry. Another option is that the remuneration for such posts will be paid by the colleges and universities from their own resources. Such professors can also teach on an honorary basis and in that case, the institutions will again pay the honorarium from their own resources. In the absence of state funding, it remains to be seen how this scheme fares in the real world. After the college campuses, let us shift our focus to markets. The supplies of cotton have taken a hit across the world due to severe weather conditions. In India too, which accounts for 40% of world's cotton supplies, 
Flash floods and drought in select cities have led to lower crop yield. Several cotton spinning mills have slashed or ceased cotton production on the back of higher prices. So against this backdrop, analysts have turned cautious over the textile sector's outlook for the near term. Our next report tells more. The extreme weather conditions coupled with lower crop yield have triggered a sharp rise in cotton prices. So far in the month of August, the prices of this commodity have surged over 11% to 50,600 rupees per bale from 45,297 rupees per bale. On the back of higher prices, spinning mills in highest cotton producing states like Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra have either trimmed production or have started to use existing stockpiles. Globally too, the production of cotton has taken a hit. Industry experts estimate lower production for the US, then world's largest producer of cotton. They pick production to plummet to 28%, the lowest seen since 2010. While this may put margin pressure on textile companies in the near term, the ones with steady inventories may benefit from this crisis in the long run. Pure cotton yarn manufacturers will be squeezed for uh, profitability of margin. Then you have the garment manufacturers on the other hand. Now they are they will be able to pass on the increase in cotton prices with some lag. So there you don't have to be very panicky. And the interim way there is uh, this people who manufacture clothes. So now those fellows can get impacted. So the worst will be worst will be the cotton yarn fellows. The next will be the cloth fellows and garment will be least impacted. That said, despite the huge cotton shortage across the country, analysts believe that India stands to storm through the crisis once prices ease. Cotton prices will come off and uh, things will get better from here. And companies with stable balance sheets, good inventory holding capacities are the ones who will. And those who are able to deliver on their uh, commitments, you know, large commitments, and who can execute large orders will benefit. So we like companies, uh, Vardaman, Meanwhile, at the bourses, shares of textile stocks like KPR Mills, Wellspun India and Verdaman Textiles have tumbled up to 45% so far this year. In comparison, frontline indices Nifty 50 and the BSC S&P Sensex climbed nearly 1% each. That apart, this holiday truncated week, investors will watch out India's quarterly GDP data. Globally, US employment data, crude oil inventory will also be tracked. As regards today, markets will react to global queues, rupee movement and crude oil prices. Investors were eagerly awaiting the outcome of the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium and the outcome may shape the market momentum for the next few days. But what exactly is this meet all about and why is there so much hype around it? Let us find out. The Jackson Hole Conference is an annual gathering of central bankers where they discuss important ideas on macroeconomic and monetary policy, emerging challenges to the global economy and other issues. Apart from the prominent bankers, finance ministers, academicians and other influential economic thinkers from around the world also take part in the event. The Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City has been hosting this annual conference since 1982. When it began, the aim was to provide a platform for promoting public discussion and exchanging ideas. The guest list for the event, which is carefully curated, is just above 100 every year. The attendees are selected based on each year's topic, with consideration for diversity in region, background and industry. Every year, there is a theme dominating the discussions in the conference. This year, it was reassessing constraints on the economy and policy. Experts in the event publish a series of papers on the theme and related subtopics. These papers have widely accepted and debated global policy circles and set the tone for policy making. 
In the 2005 event, Raghuram Rajan pointed to frailties in excessive risk taken by U.S. asset managers, undercapitalized banks, and the consequent financial market developments. He proved prescient later as Lehman crashed in 2008. Every year, market participants closely monitor the U.S. Fed chief's address to get a sense of the policy direction, and this year is no different. Investors looked for any clues on how the U.S. Fed is thinking on rates ahead of its September policy meeting. In July's meeting, some analysts believed that Fed's tone was slightly dovish after a series of aggressive hikes, but then Powell was expected to correct this perception. As expected, in a hawkish tone, the Fed chair indicated that there could be more large interest rate hikes in the coming months. Powell said in order to bring price stability, the U.S. economy should brace pain for some time. I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Jackson Hole is a famous tourist spot in the U.S. state of Wyoming, lying on the margins of snow-laden Rocky Mountain Range. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log on to businessstandard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.